Yeah. Thank you, Ingo. Um, yeah, Gamma Ray. Um, who of you has already heard about this? Okay, who has already used it? Well, I hope that will be a, f a few more after this, uh, this presentation. So, um, what is Gamma Ray? Gamma Ray is an, a runtime introspection tool for Qt. Um, if you might have encountered the, um, the tooling you find in, in current web browsers, like the Web Inspector or Firebug, um, imagine something like that just for Qt applications. So it's something that at runtime allows you to, to look at what's going on inside your application, um, but at a much higher level than a conventional instruction level debugger. Right, so you, you don't want to debug layouting issues by stepping through the queue layout implementation. You want to debug that by like, seeing the actual layout and fine tuning the, the various layouting parameters until it actually matches what you have in mind. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that we can do with Gamma Ray. But instead of um, doing all theory here, um, what I actually want to do in this session is uh, primarily show you how to use Gamma Ray and uh, show you a few real world problems um, that we investigated using Gamma Ray. Um, so to get started, um, let's look at how to, to actually um, yeah, open your application uh, with Gamma Ray and look at what's going inside there. Is this halfway readable or should I increase the font? Is okay? Good. So, um, larger? Okay. Um, Better? Okay, so. So there's two ways um, you can um, connect to an application um, similar to, to how you would use um, uh, a normal debugger, right? So you can either launch your, your application just by prefixing it with gamma ray, um, and that launches the application. This is just some some dummy widget layouting example here, and then you get the, um, the gamma ray main window started as a second, um, second window. Um, is that halfway readable? Um, I'm abusing the high DPI support in Qt here to scale it up, so there will be a few rendering glitches. Um, I have no idea if the high DPI team is here. Um, so, but in the end, what we get uh, with, uh, with Gamma Ray here is um, um, the, oh, this is actually not visible at all. So we have the, the tool selector on the left, um, starting with um, the, the object tree, uh, that's uh, the most basic tool. Um, that's what you, you have in the middle then. That's basically the entire hierarchy of all Q objects in your, in your application. And then you have the property editor uh, where you see the specific properties of that, uh, that object. Um, and that's kind of the foundation for everything else inside Gamma Ray. Um, and that's 20 or so specialized tools um, that focus on one specific aspect of Qt. Uh, for example, widgets. So there you get some layouting overlays and it limits your view to that specific kind of, uh, kind of object. Uh, but we'll see that in, in much more detail later. Um, so that's basic UI and how you start your application at the beginning. Alternatively, you can also attach at runtime. Um, so start the application. Um, either you pass the process ID on a command line like you would do it for a debugger, or you just use the, uh, the Gamma Ray launcher UI that you get by just launching Gamma Ray um, without any additional arguments. Um, you select the process uh, you want to attach to, 
uh, it does some uh, some magic in the background. It takes a while because, like attaching a debugger, uh, you need to load all the, the debug information, um, and then you get the same same main window. As you notice, there's fewer objects in there. Um, if you attach it one time, Gamma Ray is unfortunately not able to find all the objects that have been created since application startup, uh, but only those that can be found uh, by watching out for events or by walking down the, the object hierarchy. Um, so usually prefer the launching with Gamma Ray. Attaching is just if you see your application misbehave, it's very hard to reproduce that. Um, then attaching at one time um, comes in handy. Um, right, so back to this. Um, yeah, there's a few things to, um, to keep in mind. Um, the way this works is there is a, a small part, the, the part that's called probe, um, that's basically a DLL that's loaded into your application. Um, and that needs to match the Qt version you are using in your target application exactly. Um, that means the Qt version, that means the compiler, and that means the compiler settings on Windows, so debug release uh, needs to match. Um, if that doesn't match, Gamma Ray, Gamma Ray will notify you and will not even allow you to to launch the application. Um, that's probably one of the most common uh, problems you might run into. Um, and as a side effect of that, you most of the time will need to compile Gamma Ray yourself for your specific Qt configuration um, to make this work. Um, that's a bit inconvenient, but the implementation of this uh, heavily relies on all kinds of non-public internal Qt API. Um, so, and that keeps changing, right? So um, there is unfortunately no way around this. Um, right, but then the, uh, the interesting question is, what can you actually do with this, right? So what, what would I use it for? Um, and for that, I have a few um, a few examples um, that are all based on um, on real-world problems, so stuff we actually encountered in, in customer projects or uh, we run into in our own code, and where we found Gamma Ray particularly useful for, for debugging this. Um, all the examples are massively simplified, um, which might make some of the the case is a bit too obvious, but if you imagine that in uh, millions of lines of code, code you might not even know, um, having the tool that points you right to the, um, the spot where you have the problem um, becomes really valuable. So let's start with the first one. Um, slots. So this is a, a tiny widget-based application um, that has two buttons and an LCD widget, uh, one of the few remaining uses of the LCD widget. Um, and it has two basic functions. I can click on the emit button and the LCD widget increments. And I have another button that reconnects the signal from the emit button to the widget for incrementing the number. So you see that still works. We connect again, and suddenly our increment gets bigger, so let's try to fix that with another reconnect, and our increments keep getting bigger. So something is wrong there, uh, probably somehow related to signals and slots. Um, if you try to diagnose that with a com conventional debugger, right, you put a breakpoint at the code. I can actually show you the code. Um, not in this one, in this one. Uh, so maybe you can spot the problem even without the debugger. Um, 
readable. Right, so it's layout, two buttons. Um, we have the uh, reconnect signal slot, so that's the code that's executed when you click the reconnect button. And we have the signal emitted slot that's connected to the clicked signal of the, of the first button. Um, so if your number keeps incrementing somehow wrongly, what you would usually do is you use your instruction level debugger, you put a breakpoint on the, on the increment of the LCD widget and you see what triggered it, right? So what you will see is it's the clicked button, or it's the clicked signal from the push button. That's not really helping, right? That's what we expected, but um, it doesn't really tell us why we get that multiple times. Um, so let's, uh, oh, I already launched the discovery. array, so let me make this a bit bigger again. So works, reconnect, still works, reconnect again, increments get bigger, reconnect a few times, gets even bigger. So how do we find um, anything remotely related to this in, in Gamma Ray? So um, the good starting point would be the button that actually emits the, the clicked signal. So let's, um, let's find the corresponding object. I mean, you have the ability to, uh, to search in the, in the object tree, but most people don't give their objects sensible names. So you have the address in the class names, and it's not really helpful. Uh, what you can do with widgets and also with Qt Quick applications is uh, do in-app picking of, uh, of graphical elements. So if I control shift left click on the button, um, the right button is automatically selected and it's even opening the, the widget inspector because it knows I clicked on a widget. Um, and then it gives me the properties and the methods and, and so on for, for that specific object. Um, so our problem is the signal, so we can check in the methods tab. Signals are technically methods in uh, QMeta object speak. So that's where we're probably going to find the clicked signal. And first of all, let's check if how often it's actually emitted. So I can um, right click on it and connect to it. And if I now trigger it, um, you see in the output, per click, it's emitted exactly once without argument, so this is kind of what we expected. So at least at that side, it's, uh, it's all fine. Uh, I can also do the, uh, the other side. I can manually emit it. Uh, it doesn't have any arguments, so I can just confirm this. And we see it has the same effect. So. Um, I have the ability to, to monitor individual signals and I have the ability to manually trigger them, which in this case already helps me to bisect the problem. So the problem is not the emitting side, it's probably the receiver side. Um, on a slightly bigger scale, we also have the uh, signal tool. Um, that plots all the signal emissions in the entire application. Um, so for the one-click case, that is overkill. So this is the clicks coming in. Um, but if I have problems with signal emissions on a larger scale, um, this comes in handy too. Um, there's a useful feature to navigate between the various views you have in Gamma Ray. That's also in the context menu. So it offers you to basically select the same object in whatever other tool that might be applicable. Uh, so let's go back to widgets. Um, so if the, if the problem isn't on the, the sender side, uh, we can look at, well, and it's obviously not at the receiver side either because that is a one line piece of code that just increments. Um, so it might be worth looking at the uh, the connections in between. And we also have an, an option for that here. Um, so for each object, you can look at 
both the inbound and the outbound uh, connections. Um, and on that button here, we of course expect an outbound connection to the code actually incrementing our value. And um, the fact that we see some warning icons down here um, already uh, is kind of suspicious. And we see there's a clicked signal connected to the signal emitted slot uh, uh, once more and once more and once more. So apparently, we are accumulating connections. Uh, and that, of course, would, uh, would explain our problem. Um, and we can just reconnect that another time to, to verify it. And now we are already at six inbound connections on, on the slot. Or you can also, uh, by a context menu, jump between sender and receiver to, to observe both sides. Um, so this, I mean, now we have an explanation for our problem. Um, it doesn't actually answer the question why this, there is this problem, but if you look at the code now for the connection handling, you see one is done string-based, one is done pointer-based. Um, they aren't interchangeable, so you can't disconnect um, a string-based connection with a pointer-based disconnect or the other way around. Um, but at least Gamma Ray guided us to that specific um, connection handling code that we, uh, that we needed to look at. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the first example on uh, primarily on signal and slot uh, handling. And if you try that with an um, instruction level debugger, it's very hard to find out what is actually connected to a specific object there. I mean, you need to look into the queue object private internals or um, you see, well, there's a print object info function that dumps out the connection. Um, uh, but then you need to find the right object first in your, in your debugger and trigger that. So um, that comes in quite handy to have a, a nice visual view of this. Okay, so let's look at something else, something QML based for a change. Also, still a rather simple problem. Let me launch it with Gamma Ray right away. Um, that's quick event handling. So, even simpler UI. Um, let me make this slightly bigger. Just a single button is very hard to do anything wrong with just a single button. I can click it, I get some debug output from that. As long as I click like on the left side, if I click on the right side, nothing happens. Um, so something is apparently eating our events. Um, so the, the approach for this is, is similar again, right? I, I um, launch it with Gamma Ray. Um, the tool of choice for, uh, for QML is the quick scene view. Oops, this looks, this looks slightly broken. Oh, there we go, just needed a repaint. Um, so the, we saw that um, clicking on the left side works. Um, so we would expect that the, the element at that point in the screen is, um, is our actual button. So I can verify that with the, um, the picking tool uh, in, the, in the preview here. So I just click somewhere on the screen and it selects the, the corresponding object. So if I now click on the right-hand side um, where clicking doesn't work, um, I see that there's something else selected. So there's something on top of the button um, eating my events. Um, and we see it's, a, it's apparently a second button um, that is not really visible. So let's check uh, where this is in code. So this is another um, nice feature. You can directly jump to, um, to code, and it navigates your editor into the, into the right place. 
that already works for QML. Um, we are also working on making that work for, for C++ if you have debug information around. Um, so indeed, our application has a second button, um, but that's supposed to be hidden. Um, but somebody tried to hide it by making it fully transparent rather than by actually not making it visible. At least that would be the, the theory, right? So uh, another thing that, that Gamma Ray enables you to do is to actually live edit the properties, which is very useful on, on verifying this kind of theories, right? So um, if we would actually hide the button by setting it to invisible, there we go, then clicking on the right-hand side should work, right? Um, so let me do this, and indeed, this now works. Right, so this doesn't change the code, so I still need to fix the code, but with the code navigation to the right place, that's, that's fairly easy. Um, but I can test the theory without even restarting the application. Um, right. So we have the, the code navigation in, in QML, but um, as I mentioned earlier, we also produce debug output whenever I click on it. And for debug output, um, Qt also uh, provides source code information. So the same navigation works here. In the debug output view, I can jump directly to the, um, to the line that uh, produced the, the the debug information. Um, that's also useful if you get random warnings, uh, for example, from within Qt, and you want to find out what's actually triggering this and how to get rid of it. Um, right, so that's the QML case. And I mean, this looks like a trivial example, but imagine having that in an application with many, many screens and there's suddenly the not completely invisible on-screen keyboard hiding half of your screen, and um, you can click on the upper half, but the lower half doesn't work. Um, identifying that one element in a big code base that is messing up your event handling is just so much easier if you can do the, uh, this kind of, um, of just click on this place and show me everything that's there. Um, actually, let me show you one more thing that's a rather new feature in it. Um, if I just use the, uh, the picker, I get like the top level element at this specific location, which is most of the time the element I actually want. Um, I can also do control shift click on that location and I get a complete set of all elements that stack on top of each other there. Um, For event handling, that's sometimes helpful, but that also comes in very useful for um, painting artifacts or just seeing what actually is visible there on top of each other because all of this has rendering costs. So um, you get a fairly detailed view on what's actually stacked up there. Um, and the same is also possible for, for widget layouts. Um, okay, ah, now we have my favorite example, uh, something slightly more advanced than the event handling. Uh, let me do this without gamma ray first. Uh, quick batching. So this is two pretty QML sliders. Um, consists of a of a few rectangles in a list view and slightly changes color. So pretty basic stuff, one would think. If we look at the code, um, that's actually all, right? So it's, it's a fairly simple program. Uh, but once you run this through, say, API trace, um, which you would usually not do for something that simple, but which you would do once uh, somebody complains that your application using your fancy sliders is slightly too slow. Um, oops. Ah, oh, QML missing. Um, 
that's all we need. Uh, this one. Yeah. We see that the two simple sliders need 740 <laughs> GL calls. Um, we dive down there, we see there's a lot of them are draw calls, so that's the expensive part in, in OpenGL. Um, usually what one, one would assume that this is maybe four or five draw calls, right? So something is clearly wrong there, and if we look anywhere in this, in what's actually happening, we see it, it's actually drawing rectangle by rectangle. Um, and this is like the slowest possible way you can do uh, OpenGL. Um, and then you lose all the advantages of, of Qt Quick. Um, now, how, how to debug this? I mean, the, um, there's a tiny bit of background information uh, needed for this. Uh, let me just jump to the magic code for this from the um, batch renderer. So how the way Qt Quick renders um, its content is it tries to batch together as many visual elements as possible and then merge them together in a single draw call. And then a single draw call tries to do as much as possible in parallel, uh, and that's where the GPU is really efficient. So this is like the sweet spot for rendering performance. That's where you want to get to. And this is the, um, like, the core part of the logic that decides if these batches can be merged together. Um, but this isn't really, right, I mean, getting from this to why do my sliders not batch correctly um, in itself isn't really useful, right? So we need something to actually look into into the running application and see, okay, this is the transformations we are doing, this doesn't match the, the logic and, um, and so on. So uh, let me keep this here and oops, switch back to here. So um, let me run this in gamma ray. So for some of this, um, Qt Quick has built-in diagnostics, uh, because I guess uh, certain other people also had similar questions when debugging the, um, the scene graph renderer. Um, if they implemented this with uh, um, debugging categories, Gamma Ray would give you the option to enable them at runtime. Um, that come comes in handy in particularly for the rendering code because that produces a huge amount of output every frame, right? So you want to see, usually you want to, to see diagnostics for like one moment somewhere at one time where you actually have the problem and that's not necessarily right from application startup, right? So you want to navigate to the screen that is broken, then enable the diagnostics and then look at what's actually going on. Um, and thanks to categorized logging in Qt, you can actually do this with, uh, with Gamma Ray, and it also shows you the, the kind of uh, different categories that Qt provides and that you could enable. Um, rendering is particularly interesting and, um, and input handling as well. Unfortunately, the, um, the scene graph batching code uses some ad hoc approach with environment variables. That still needs to be ported to this, so that's not actually helping us in this case. Uh, but that's the place where we started in to see if we can actually get some information. Um, so we need to look a lot deeper into what's actually going on here. And for that, we have the scene graph view. So this actually shows us the, the, the internal structure that you hardly get access to from, from the outside of what the, the quick renderer uses to um, well, actually not here, this is the view, um, what's, what's happening inside. Um, 
And if you remember the complex condition for merging, one of the in there is um, in, is the transformation matrix, say, for 2D-only transformations. Um, you would assume that our non-transformed rectangles, or seemingly non-transformed rectangles, um, would be fine for this, right? There's no rotation, no affine, affine transformations, or anything like this in there. Um, or, so it looks from the result. But if you look at the actual transformation matrix that is applied, um, you'll notice in the combined matrix for one of the small rectangles in our slider that there's a negative number on the diagonal. Um, and then anything that's not like same numbers on the diagonal is somewhat like a rotation. Um, and that's actually triggering the condition in the merger. So the merger thinks this is a um, a tricky rotation that it can't merge. And um, yeah, that's giving us the, the problem we have. Um, so we are one step further already. We know that something is, is introducing a transformation that, um, that breaks the merger. Um, but now we need to find out where this is actually coming from. And um, if you look, there's, there's two properties here per node. There's uh, matrix and combined matrix. Matrix is the transformation that happens in this specific step. And this is harmless, right? This is a, a simple translation. And then combined matrix is basically everything along the, the hierarchy up to this point. So um, we can go up the hierarchy and uh, identify the node. This one, for example. There you see the matrix one actually is the one introducing the, the minus on the diagonal. So we can switch back to items and it identifies um, the, the specific element um, uh, introducing the, the rotation. And um, yeah, we see that there's some place in the code that tries to be clever regarding list view layouting and just flips it around by 180 degrees. Um, looks in the result as if there would be no translation involved, uh, no transformation involved, um, but that's enough already to break the, the batch merger. Um, so this is one and uh, not that much time, so I'll just skip finding the other one and take this out as well. Um, same approach, so you remove the first one, you find the second one. Um, just quickly showing you that this is actually the, the problem. So of course, now the, the sliders are the wrong way around and the handles are all on the same side. So I actually broke the application, but if I run this with API trace, we are, oops. There we go. Right now we are down to 76 uh, GL calls. Um, so this is, yeah. Um, what was the other one? 700 something, so about a factor of 10 um, faster rendering or less GL calls, which is usually comparable to faster rendering. Um, that, of course, still leaves me with an application where my sliders are the wrong way around, but that me just means I need to find a solution that does this without rotating. Um, again, navigating through the scene graph tree with the conventional instruction level debugger, trying to find the matrix, print out the matrix in a way that you can actually read it, and then identify the, the node that broke it, map that back to code. Um, fairly complicated, um, unless you have tools that actually support you in doing this. Okay, so I think that's the, the most complicated ex example I, <coughs> I have for this. Um, let's look at something from a somewhat different field. Classical old school widget layouting problem. 
Um, so we have this complicated dialogue. Um, it's somewhat resizable, but yeah, this is as small as it gets, right? So apparently something is blocking it from um, uh, making it uh, smaller in, in the vertical direction. Um, if you look at that, right, you would assume it's, uh, it's those address group boxes at the side, right? The street field sounds like something that can use like several lines of text. So maybe this is actually all, all correct, but if I need the dialogue smaller, right, then something needs to be re rearranged. Um, so Gamma Ray allows me to, um, uh, to verify that. Um, at runtime without actually changing anything. So I again select the, um, the widget I want with control shift click in the application, or I can also use the, um, the preview down here and the picking mode in there. Um, so let's, uh, let's just hide this entire box um, to see if this actually fixes our problem. Uh, and apparently it doesn't. So something else is keeping up the space. Um, so this approach is, is uh, rather useful for kind of bisecting the layouting problem, right? Usually you would do exactly the same with recompile cycles. So you, you take out something, you recompile, and you see if that fixed the problem, then the problem is in the part you took out and so on. Uh, with Gamma Ray, you can, can do this in the live application. Um, saves you a lot of round trips, in particular when you are working on embedded targets with slow cross compilation and um, uh, yeah, expensive deploy cycles. So um, how do we find the, the thing that prevents this from getting smaller? Uh, you already see the, uh, this blue area that's basically highlighting the, the spacing areas and the elements in the individual layout. So I can just click through those and see what's actually in here. And that very quickly shows me that there's apparently one widget down here, a label, which currently doesn't have a text, which I don't see, but by just selecting it uh, on screen, um, Gamma Ray gives me the ability to identify the, yeah, invisible things, but things that still need, uh, need space. Um, and for that, I mean, we can now investigate on why it's not resizable. And again, for this, uh, the tool of choice is the, the, the property view. Um, I mean, there's uh, usual suspects like uh, size policy, uh, so as you can see here, Gamma Ray supports even the, the more complicated types in the, in the property editor, um, at least the, the queue types or basically anything that's a gadget or a queue object or a type that we manually edit. Um, so the, you can look at the individual details and, and modify them. Um, size policy looks sane in this thing, but uh, the minimum size here looks uh, like it could be the problem. So we can again edit that live and see if that, uh, yeah, that fixes our problem. So again, this doesn't actually fix your problem in code yet, but it, you have verified that you have found the, the reason for, for your problem. And now you can actually fix this in code without even having a single recompile cycle. Um, Okay, so that's uh, widget layouting. Uh, right, something else I can show you quickly is um, state machines. And let me show the code for this as well. Is this. So this is a simple example that implements a traffic light with, uh, with a declarative state machine, uh, which I think is 
the standard example for anything state machine related. Um, but you see, this is already like doesn't fit on a single screen anymore. Um, finding anything in there that uh, why is this actually not running? Let me start that. Uh, finding any logic errors in a state machine just by looking at the code or stepping through the implementation is uh, is fairly tedious. And if you look at um, the flow of the traffic light, um, you notice that now it's going from green to red without going through the yellow state. Right from uh, looking at the code, um, finding the right place there. Um, yeah, for something that has four or five states, you will manage, but in reality, you have something with hundreds of states. Um, finding that in code is, uh, is fairly messy. So what we offer for that is um, uh, is a graphical display of the, of the state machine layout and a live view of the, the, the configuration, right? And there we immediately see that apparently we put one transition in the wrong place and have the green to red state dangling unreachable on the top. And you already see it's live updating and if I put the pause button on, so all the various state types in, in Qt are supported by this. Um, right, and then one more. Uh, that's a brand new one that uh, isn't even completely enabled yet in the released version. And I think then we are running out of time. Um, that's the Qt 3D inspector. Um, so here we have a rotating cylinder and um, yeah, apparently something is, is messed up there. Um, we notice that the light reflections are somewhat off and most importantly, there's apparently some, some part missing. Um, so if we look at that in the geometry view, and never mind the black thing, that is a high DPI scaling issue. So in a normal version, you wouldn't see that. Um, we can look at the geometry of the elements we, we have in, in a Qt 3D scene. Oops. And my middle mouse button doesn't work. Uh, I want to see the, there. If we look at the bottom of this, we see that apparently something is, is missing there. That's actually a, a fairly common problem in, in 3, 3D geometry. Um, if you render the triangles in the wrong order, right, you don't see them because you're looking at them back. Um, here we have a very useful diagnostic feature where we just disable that back face culling and render the stuff you're looking at from the wrong side in, in red. So we see that our geometry is actually actually correct. We are just looking at it from the from the wrong side, right? So it's just a matter of changing the index order. Um, but again, the difference from you don't see anything to um, you can at least verify that your vertices are in the wrong, in the, in the right place already. You, you just, your index order is wrong. Um, helps a lot to, to diagnose this problem. So that at least explains the, the missing bit in our, our cylinder. And the other feature we have in here is showing the, the normal vectors. And that explains the, the weird light issue we have. So I'm not sure how well this is visible on the, the big screen. You see these tiny blue hairs. Um, that's the, the normal vectors per, per vertex. So and if we look at this somewhat from the, from the side, yeah, there you see it. You see that they are somewhat bent towards the center rather than being per, perfectly per, uh, straight off the, the surface. So that's again something that is, uh, uh, that has some, some visual impact, right? But it's very hard to, uh, yeah, to diagnose this without actually seeing what's, what's happening. 
Um, if you want to see more details, we can of course also look at like the raw buffer data that's uh, that's uh, sent there. Um, but this is this is much harder to read, right? This is mostly if you're generating the geometry and want to compare if if that's actually what you put in there, um, or to find uh, memory leaks. We, if you suddenly see bizarre numbers in there and far more than you expected, then apparently something else is wrong. Uh, but the visualization is that um, is what really makes the the thing useful, I think. Um, right, so I don't think we have time for the remaining demo, so let me switch back to the uh, slide deck. Um, all, the, all the examples I showed here and also those that, um, that I couldn't show here are all part of the, the Gamma Ray manual, um, including a, a description on yeah, basically what I what I showed you here, and well, a few more examples that that I didn't have time for. Um, that leaves us with the question on where you can actually get gamma ray. Um, the the tool is available on on GitHub, so it's uh, available as, uh, as GPL and also under commercial license, um, and it's also part of the Qt Automotive suite. Um, uh, where it also comes with a, a creator integration uh, to make it even easier to use. Um, if you want to see it in action or play with it, um, at our table downstairs, um, there's a demo connected to an embedded device. Uh, so while I, everything I showed you here is, um, is desktop only, um, it also works remotely with, a, with an embedded target. Um, yeah, I think that's um, that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions? Hello. Uh, how hard is uh, Gamma Ray to maintain? Like, uh, if it's all using all this private API, I can I can see just now what you showed. Like, I probably broke something that was there in five eight. So, like, uh, both how, how easy is it to maintain and how do you maintain it between different versions of Qt? Um, yeah, that's, that's indeed a problem, uh, given, the, given that we support anything back to Qt 4.8 and we use a lot of private API that you guys keep breaking. <laughs> um, well, the best thing we can do is large CI coverage and um, adapt it for every Qt version. So it's, I mean, if you look at the code, it's, there's a lot of if devs, there's a lot of special cases for different Qt versions. A lot of features are only available in certain Qt versions um, as there's new stuff being added, right? So we, we try to release with every Qt version and try to keep up. Um, I don't think there's a way to make this Easier. I mean, we we already added a few, not entirely public, but somewhat stable APIs to to Qt to make this easier, like the the hooks for object creation and object destruction. Uh, before that, it was a lot more messier. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's work. Um, there's I don't think there's much you can you can do to to simplify this. Thank you. Um, can you use Gamma Ray on an embedded device, like uh, debug or yep. edit properties, whatever? Um, do you have a server running on an embedded device? Or? Right. Okay. Um, right. The, uh, the probe part, the part running in the application, actually opens a, a socket, and that's what the, uh, the client connects to. So this works locally as well as remotely. Um, we have that downstairs. If you look at, uh, at our table there, it's connected to an embedded device. Thank you. Uh, and it supports uh, Linux, QNX, Android uh, on the embedded target, and um, Linux, Windows, and OS X on the, on the host. Any more questions? Thank you, Volker. Thank you.